Hello, I'm Amara Jones, and welcome to Lives at Stake, a series of monthly discussions about issues facing transgender and gender non-conforming people across the United States. Lives at Stake is a co-production of my projects Translash and WNYC's The Green Space. Go to translash.org and thegreenspace.org to sign up for our newsletters and to follow our work. Well, today is a really exciting day for our show. First of all, it's the first show since our launch in March that we haven't actually focused on COVID-19. And I said last month that we were going to arrive at this day and guess what we have. And the second reason is because, more excitingly maybe, um, is today is the premiere of my new documentary, the new trans slash documentary, The Future of Trans, which explores what a trans future might look like. This film has been in the works for over a year. And it started when it occurred to me that I did not have as a child something, a gift actually, that most people have when they are children. And that's the ability to imagine yourself in the future as yourself. It also occurred to me that at a time when they are literally trying to erase us, that imagining our future is a radical act. So me and the Trans Flash team hit the, team, hit the, the country um, and the road over the last month off and on, not continuously, of course, uh, to do just that. Of course, we had glimpses of the future from the Black uh, liberation uh, for Black trans lives that occurred just nine days ago. It's the largest gathering for trans rights in the history of our country. And of course, just one day later, another glimpse of the future is the ruling by the Supreme Court affirmatively for trans employment rights, the inability to discriminate against us in employment, a part of a larger LGBTQ case. And we will be talking to Chase Strangio of the ACLU uh, right uh, before the film premieres in order to talk about that. But uh, trans slash and the future of trans takes a much larger view. That's why we talk to people such as um, uh, Angelica Ross and Dominic Jackson and artists such as Chella and Fatima Jamal and activists like Issa Noyola to ponder what a trans future might look like. And right after the film premieres, we're going to talk to artist Alok, who just wrote a book, Beyond the Gender Binary, and Richie Shazam. Every time I say that, I feel like a lightning bolt or something ought to strike, uh, to talk about the way in which imagination and creativity are key to shaping our future. It's going to be an exciting and a rich show. Now, normally we would be actually in the green space, and the green space is an actual space with the studio, and I there'd be a live audience there as well as a virtual audience but we're not able to do that just yet i may actually end up going to record in the studio next month just because we speech isn't kind of open so why not me go in personally uh but until that time this show is virtual and what that means is that we really need you to participate throughout so um using all of the social media platforms and the hashtags lives at stake the future of trans and trans slash tell us your thoughts your questions we'll be sure to include those throughout the program um and of course when the film is running to share us your thoughts now we start every single program every single lives at stake with memes and videos and gifts that are getting us through in this moment or just amusing either rightly or wrongly the ones today are in the wrong category. Um, so the first one up today is what I call the um, Revenge of the Karens. It's, of course, this woman who has to wear a mask. She decided to cough um, on the food of patrons in this coffee shop, as well as them personally. Um, hashtag super spreader. Someone called the CDC. Oh, never mind. The CDC is closed right now. Um, maybe your local health department. Um, and then the next one that I thought is so appropriate given all the protests and the pushback and the incredible manifestations that are happening on the street, you know, they're often seen as tear gas confrontations, but it doesn't always have to be that way. Look at this, you know, bring a little bit of ball culture to every single demonstration, do a death drop in front of the cops. Um, why not? They need it. Um, and more death drops at, at, in front of cops would be a good thing. Um, so that's what's getting us through at this moment. We'll see you know, what happens next month, it, it, it changes. Um, before we get to the show though tonight, um, I really do think that it's important for us to start with the historic moment at the Supreme Court last week because it literally is the future in the making. 
By six to three, the court affirmed LGBTQ employment rights. But within that was something that was even more important, the fact that one of the plaintiffs, Amy Stevens, was the first transgender plaintiff to ever appear before the court. And it was the first major ruling on transgender rights in the history of the United States by the Supreme Court. And that's why I'm thrilled that we are joined by Chase Strangio, who is the Deputy Director of Transgender Justice at ACLU, and more importantly, I guess, or as importantly, the mastermind uh, behind the ruling recently, um, Amy Stevens, was actually Chase's own client, I think you can see right now, a video of Chase with uh, Laverne Cox and um, Sada Ramirez, uh, the day of the, um, the arguing of the case, unfortunately, Amy passed last month, right before the ruling. Um, but we are here to talk with Chase, who is booked and busy. You're writing so many articles, and you have an appearance after this in the Disclosure Conversation. So Chase, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so, so excited to see you and um, to be here and to celebrate your work. Thank you so much. Um, um, your work is pivotal. And one of the questions that I have for you is, um, are you still in shock? <laughs> has it, are you still, has your body come back? Has your mind come back into your body or how are you actually feeling? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it is incredibly, you know, surprising to sort of integrate what happened with what our expectations were. And I remember you and I spoke just a few days after the argument and I was not feeling necessarily optimistic about the prospects for the case and sort of gearing up for the fact that, you know, win or lose that ultimately it's gonna be our mobilization in other contexts that's gonna impact how we move forward no matter what. And and that is still true. And so I think we still have to hold that because we're not we're not gonna get full justice from the Supreme Court. And this was, you know, an incredible victory years in the making. And in fact, Amy's case was the first explicitly trans rights case. Um, ever decided by the Supreme Court, but she actually wasn't the first trans plaintiff. Dee Farmer, oh. a, black, a black trans woman who was a jailhouse lawyer, was the first trans um, person to appear before the Supreme Court in a prisoner rights case that was litigated um, years ago. So I think that there's just so much um, history that brought us to this moment. Um, and even just the fact that the uh, the mobilization for Black trans lives was the day before the decision, really to me speaks to how we got this conservative court to rule for us. Because the law hasn't changed since 1964. What's changed is people's demand um, and presence uh, in front of um, conservative people. So, you know, Justice Gorsuch, who wrote the opinion and the chief who signed it, um, you know, they're living in a world where trans people are making ourselves known and visible and demanding justice. And so I think that is an important thing to hold because it wasn't just the legal arguments that we, we made. And in fact, I think more importantly, it was all of the ways that people showed up. Yeah, um, on that point, the idea that win or lose, that we still have to mobilize. One of the questions that I have for you is, what does this ruling mean and what does it mean for our community? You know, we still have um, the trans military ban. We still have the exclusion um, by De De Betsy DeVos's education department of trans people from civil rights protections in schools that's still on the books, the healthcare ruling. And of course, these the movements in 20 states across the country, either through, through the legislature or through lawsuits to ban trans rights in some way. So can you tell us what this case means for us and what it doesn't mean? Yeah, so starting with sort of what it definitely means, um, you know, unequivocally, it means that LGBTQ people are protected from discrimination in employment across the country. Um, there's really no question. It was a very clear ruling. I also think it unequivocally means, at least from my perspective, and I think most courts would agree, that that applies in the context of other federal laws that prohibit sex discrimination. So that includes education, healthcare, housing and shelter, and credit. Um, as well as when the government discriminates in the context of constitutional equal protection violations. So this actually does have sweeping implications for a lot of the areas where the Trump administration has been attacking us. Um, you know, the healthcare rule, for example, which came out the Friday before this decision, it was premised on an interpretation of sex under federal law that the Supreme Court rejected. And as much as the Trump administration and Betsy DeVos and Attorney General Barr would like to believe they're the final word on what these um, 
statutory protections mean? They're, they're not. The Supreme Court is, and they have spoken. So I think that when it comes to enforcing the healthcare rule in the way the Trump administration wants to, they absolutely cannot do that. Um, and we are already in court um, in healthcare cases to enforce that. Same is true as to cases involving education. Now, I think where obviously there's still a lot more legal work to do is in defending the attacks on trans people in the states. Um, so we know that this past legislative session, there were 20 bills targeting trans people in sports using incredibly regressive notions of sex verification that have a deeply anti-Black um, and misogynist history. Those are being pushed and we're gonna have to fight them and we're in court in two states fighting them right now. The other thing that we're seeing are efforts to criminalize healthcare for trans youth. Those attacks are also going to keep coming and we're going to have to keep fighting them. And then obviously there's just the inherent limits to the law. Um, you know, you can have formal equality norms, you can have regulations, you can have policy, and at the end of the day, those structures adapt to maintain power for the people who have always had power. So there's just a limit to what this means. You know, you can have employment protections and people still get fired. People still face discrimination. And that's why I think we need to imagine rad more radical transformation in everything that we do. Mm -hmm. um, can you just tell us um, something that we may not have known about um, Amy Stevens? You know, I've heard some recordings of her um, and the letter that she had written in case the, the, the case um, turned in her favor. And she's incredibly powerful, although, you know, if people would look at her as a person who was older and disabled, wouldn't necessarily get that. And I'm wondering if you can tell us something that the public doesn't know about Amy and what made you keep fighting for her so, so long and so vigorously. Yeah, I mean, I think Amy had such a resolve herself and, you know, she was a, a funeral director. And so her <laughs> calling was to comfort people in times of, of like real deep grief. You know, she, she was able to, to sort of have the ability to be present and comforting without centering herself, you know, and I think that really is what you what you want in in a funeral director you know that that was really her first calling and then she got fired because she's trans and she took that into her second calling was which was to really to build a movement for trans justice and not to build it she knew she wasn't building it she was joining it and 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 sort of expanding it in her own way as this person who you know, I think the other thing about her, and I really recommend people look for the piece that her wife Donna wrote, is that she and her wife had this incredibly loving relationship. And Donna, had, you know, in Amy's final days, she still didn't know what happened with the Supreme Court case, but she never lost hope. And she urged Donna to keep on, keep up the fight. And there was this sort of incredibly compassionate, hopeful energy that she brought that is like the opposite of me. I, I'm sort of like a frenetic, Northeastern, anxious, completely pessimistic person. Um, and she was such a counterpoint to my energy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think that her wife wrote that article yesterday, I yeah. think. Um, and so that, that can be found. Um, and lastly, um, you wrote an article um, that appeared in the Atlantic today called The Trans Future I Never Dreamt Of. And so I'm wondering if you could tell us what it feels like through your work to actually be creating trans possibilities, to be actually helping to create the future for people. Yeah, I mean, I think that one, one of the things that was so striking for me about being in the courtroom on the day of the argument as a trans person is that, it, you know, and with all of this privilege that I carry, you know, as a person who's formally educated as a white lawyer, you know, in many ways, like I, I look like everyone else in the courtroom. And yet I think there was so little sense that I could survive. Like I didn't believe it as a child. And I, yeah. you know, I, I got gender affirming surgery in law school and if, using student loans. And if I hadn't had access to that, I would never have made it up to that point. And so there was this very sort of circular feeling about it, which was the Trump administration is trying to kill us with these regulations to take away our health care, which would guarantee that we're never in positions like the position that I had the privilege of being in. Um, and by virtue of the fact that I had access to that care and to mentors and to magical trans people who 
helped me feel safe inside myself, I was able to then sort of move through life in a way that I might not otherwise have been able to. And so I think my hope is that in the fight, even when we're working within the institutions, which I am inherently doing as a lawyer, it's compromise driven and I see that. But the hope is that we can create some possibilities for people to gain things that they need to survive and lead and live and and so and thrive and and, and that to me sort of felt what was really incredible about the juxtaposition of Trump trying to take away our healthcare, trying to say that it's not discrimination to systematically mis- misgender and abuse us, and the Supreme Court to rebuke that um, in a in a case that had a lot of trans leadership in it. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you so much for everything that you um, have done and de- dedicated your life to do. There's so much work to be done that it's undeniable that uh, the world is a better place uh, because of what you're doing and what you have done. And also for taking the time tonight, I know you're going right into um, the disclosure kind of town hall at nine o'clock right after this. So I really appreciate um, you taking the time. And also people can check out a GQ article about you. I'm sure your DMs are going to be really full. Cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Chase. It's great to see you and I, I really appreciate the time. Thank you, Amara, and I really appreciate you. And I just love sharing space with you. And thank you for including me in what you're building for the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. That is Chase Strangio, who is the Deputy Director of Transgender Justice and a mastermind of the legal victory, the historic legal victory for trans employment rights last week before the Supreme Court of the United States. Well, we've come to the point in the show where I feel like a curtain should come down or something because we are about to premiere our film, The Future of Trans, which explores what trans futures look like. I'm super excited for you to come along with me in the next uh, 16 and a half minutes of this film on this particular journey to see what that looks like as we're going through the film. Of course, please comment, like, share, ask questions, um, and I'll be on the timeline and responding to those. We'll include them in the show. And so now, without further ado, the future of trans. I grew up in Atlanta as a boy, even though I always knew that I was a girl. This total split between who I was inside and how I was allowed to present in the world made it impossible for me to see myself accurately, made it impossible for me to see my future. I did imagine a future. It was a future of Star Trek. It was a future of Star Wars. Who I actually was, however, was nowhere to be found. Now, as an adult, I want to give myself the gift of imagining a future with me in it. But even more than that, as trans and gender non-conforming people, creating a vision of our future at a time of social backlash, violent erasure, and plague is a radical act. That's why I'm taking this journey to talk to some of the brightest and bravest people I know to find our future. Like all stories, going forwards means sometimes looking backwards first. I have to go back to the place where I started to see where I'm going and to imagine where we're all going. I'm starting this journey in Atlanta, where I grew up, talking to my friend, activist Tony Michelle Williams, just steps away from my elementary school. I want to know if there was ever a moment when you were a child when you could have imagined as you are now? It was once at my sixth birthday party. And um, I used to love the Power Rangers. Maybe I was a Mighty Morphin one, honey. But particularly, I like um, one of the evil villains. Oh, yeah. And she had the Madonna bra and the large horn. And girl. That was you. That was me. And so whenever I would play in the neighborhood with the friends, I would want to always play that role. And so at my sixth birthday party, my mom, of course. And she I, got you the boys. And so she got me the blue and black ranger. 
And baby, I just cried the whole party. <laughs> what I used to do as a kid is for this happened for a long time, like for a long time. At the end of the day, when I was in my room by myself in bed, I would literally reimagine my entire day as if I had been a girl. It was the entire replay. It was like me redoing it. Period. And totally rewriting every single day. Yes. That's just so sexy. <laughs> <laughs> It's so sexy, it's so powerful because it is, it is really the magic of trans people. That's the magic of queer people. That's the magic of our children, right? That they have such expansive imaginations. For me, when I got to be 18, I felt like I had to leave Atlanta. Yeah. You went to college in Virginia. Yeah. But then you came back to Atlanta. What about Atlanta to you said, this is what this is where there's a future for me. Oh, I get it's home. You have to leave. You have to leave at some point, whether you leave for two years or four years, ten. You do have to leave Atlanta. Um, and if you were good to Atlanta, baby, it will always be kind back to you. So for you, what is it that you imagine mm. for the future? I imagine music, and with imagining music, I see and imagine black bodies, black children basking and moving, like in joy and in certainty, like and in love and in connection. At 28 years old, for the first time, literally about five months ago, I imagined life for myself that like I could live past this. Leaving where we grew up to create a future is what many trans people have done. And so many of us have ended up in San Francisco's Tenderloin District. That's why I'm headed there to see Arya Said, who runs the world's first trans historic district. There are still clues about our collective future and our collective past. Are dedicating this past Trans people had been continuously living in this neighborhood since the 1920s. It was the red light district. It's the central city. All of those contributing factors influenced how trans people were able to live in a place like San Francisco. When you finally got here at 19, leaving home at 17, what were you trying to actualize? While I was in college, there were tons of people from the Bay Area who were going to school uh, at where I went to school in Southern Oregon. And so they were like, oh, if you were in San Francisco, like, you would be really accepted. Um, so I came with $60 and was like, I'm going to San Francisco and I heard they're gonna give me my surgery and hormones. Got to the Greyhound station here and then um, was staying at a hostel in the Tenderloin um, and put my name on a bed for the youth shelter um, when I ran out of money. I remember when I was sleeping on the train and I pay, I used the BART payphone um, at Powell Street BART and I called my mom and she was like, you're insane, just come back. But her condition was that I couldn't come back looking like this, right? That was always her thing. But I was like, well, I'm not going back as a failure. I'm staying in the city till I become the queen of the city. When did you first imagine yourself to be able to live as you are now. Yeah, that was what kept me alive. You know, that someday you could be who you want to be. And I think I had a craving just to be normal. Stories like Aria's take center stage in the hit television show Pose. The show uses trans history to create the idea of trans possibilities. What do you see as our future? It looks like us being human beings. Like us walking into places and not having to say, hi, I'm trans. But hi, I'm a doctor. Hi, I'm an educator. Hi, I'm a lawyer. Hi, I clean the streets. But it shouldn't be, hi, I'm trans. So when you wake up and you hear, a girl is murdered is or a trans now. man is murdered. It becomes really personal because you think to yourself, this could be me. 
Because even while creating our futures, harsh realities can bring us right back to the present. Yo, the reality is I spend many days crying. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I get the news, just like everybody gets the news over Instagram, when you're just trying to check for pretty pictures of what your friends are doing, and then, oh my God. Against the backdrop of ongoing pain and seeming hopelessness, is a bright future still possible? Issa Noyola, who fights for the most marginalized of the marginalized, helps us answer this question. We're standing in front of the Eloy detention facility um, here in Arizona, where um, people are being held who've come to the United States mm -hmm. as asylees, as refugees. There are trans people that are locked on the inside mm -hmm. who are here only because they were fleeing for their lives yeah. or they needed to have a better life for a variety of reasons. It's yeah. the only reason why they're in there. Yeah. When we're standing here, like, how does it make you feel about the future? That is to say, how can we yeah. stand here and be talking about a future that's anything but hard. Yeah. It always gives me chills. Um, it's always really hard to drive and to realize that our people are locked up inside unjustly um, and they're experiencing human rights violations on the daily basis. They're being tortured, they're being um, held um, when there's no reason to hold them um, in, in, a, in a way that is denying their humanity. Are the trans people inside they came here for a better future. Yeah. Do you still think that they have hope for that? I think so. I mean, a lot of them are there with that hope because they've seen the ways that they're, you know, they, they're, they've tried everything that they can. It's like Roxana, who died in detention center a couple of years ago, yeah. the only reason why she left was because she was an HIV positive trans woman who couldn't access health care, who even she couldn't find employment. Um, she was being, although her family supported her, she was being harassed on a daily basis. And so she joined a caravan and, you know, only to face her death. But against all the odds, plunging ourselves into the unknown, if we make it to the other side, what does that look like? Shia Diamond, who moved from incarceration to pop stardom, has some answers. Do you see yourself in the future? Wow, I don't think we were ever given permission to imagine um, just the possibilities of our future. You know, um, I feel like that I probably wouldn't make it to my 20s. Here it was two years ago, I was kissing 40. And now just looking here and just looking at how far I've come, um, I didn't see myself past incarceration for the 10 years. Um, it, it was so many, um, like dark days and that I just thought I wouldn't make it or survive. I thought either the streets would kill me or I would just take myself out. And just to see a different version of myself, to see a more happy, uh, a, a, a more confident, you know, version of myself is, it's still, I'm still looking on the outside. You know, it still feels new. It does, it does, it, it does. As trans people, our individual journeys have weakened the very idea of gender binaries. Moving beyond the idea of only men or women creates the possibility of a future that's wide open, a future without limits. I don't want to pinpoint what the future looks like. Huh. I might be able to say what the future feels like, but I don't want to say what it looks like. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, actually challenging the gender binary doesn't look like a certain thing. I contain so much more than what I look like. <laughs> That's always going to be an approximation. Mm. But like energetically and spiritually, I have entire ecosystems in me. Are you going to be committed to what you don't see? And I think in my world, we are just as committed to what we don't see as what we do. When we limit people's imagination, that ultimately kills any sort of liberation. And I refuse to allow anyone to stifle my creativity and my imagination. To me, that is something I, as a child, was very important to me. And I think that's my ancestors whispering in my ear and saying they can't get your mind. Like, no matter what, no one can get my mind. Binary wasn't a thing. Like, there were at least four genders in so many different cultures. Like, I think we need to have a full circle return to that. And remember, like, we've always been here. We're a part of humanity. We're natural. I want to see a return to that. We carry with us 
not only the wisdom of our ancestors, but also wisdom from our own experiences and our own pasts. If your present self could go back to yourself at 10, what do you think that you would tell them now? Man, I'd be like, I'd be like, I know you know who you are and I know you're terrified, but number one, you're gonna figure it out, you're gonna be okay. And number two, just like I'm telling all the kids who show up to my talk, everything's on a continuum. You don't need a box. You don't need to technically find a definition online that you connect with. It helps at the time being, but you don't need it. You will be with family and a chosen, a chosen family and luckily enough, a biological family that loves you, which is a privilege to have but you'll figure it out and you'll be okay. It's strange because in a way you're helping to create the future by existing in the present? Yes, I, yeah, I guess, which is very nice to say and I hope I'm doing a good job creating that. Future. I mean, but I wonder if that, has that, has that ever occurred to you, right? That like being the person who you are right now, that you actually are giving other people a future. It's a really nice thought. I, I don't think I stop enough to think about it. I think memory is important because if you can at least own your own history, that just gives you a little bit more fire to create more history, you know? Right. So, like, if we can right. claim the stories of the Marsha P. Johnsons or mm -hmm. the black trans folks like Mary Jones and Francis mm -hmm. Thompson in the 1800s, mm -hmm. um, that gives us a, a starting point, you know, that's further back than we ever could have imagined. Driven by our memory and our creativity, documenting our stories will form our collective futures. Artist Fatima Jamal explains why. What is it that you're trying to create? An archive. <laughs> An archive of what? An archive of my existence. I do believe that one day, like my nieces and nephews, my little cousins, right, they will ask more questions about my absence, you know? Mm. They will mm -hmm. ask more questions about the path that I took for my life. What do you want them to find? And what do you want them to learn? A life otherwise, you know? Because I think we all know that life, life is possible, but a life otherwise um, is what transness um, does, though it may come with the consequence of um, isolation. It also comes with the consequence of joy, right, of, of a life not controlled by mm -hmm. others' gazes, by others' um, desires and expectations for who you should be and become. I want them to see and test the limits of your own body. The most beautiful thing about transness is choice and decision making. A, a trans perspective and a trans lens on the world could only free us all. Because whatever future we are building, it will ultimately become a memory. It will ultimately be remembered for what we leave behind. And that's what I have learned on this journey, that all of our futures, grounded in creativity, depend on remembering all those who came before us and imagining new worlds for those yet to come. So what did you guys think? Did you like it? I could tell from some of the comments that you did 
Um, I was getting them as they were coming through the way in which various people touched you, um, uh, such as Aria and Chase. Um, and I would just really appreciate a lot of the things that uh, you're saying. One person, the Power Rangers. I didn't know that the Power Rangers were such, <laughs> were such you know, a big part of people's identity. Um, one person said that they had chosen their name. Um, I think Kimberly is her name. Uh, chosen her name off the of Power Rangers, but hid it until she was 30, but something that was inculcated in her as a child. It's just this whole thing of the way in which creativity and imagination do really play into our future. But because I can't see you, you have to keep communicating and telling me what you thought and what you liked. So keep it up in the timeline and we'll keep including those. Um, so we wanted to continue the conversation specifically exactly on what I just touched upon, which is this intersection of creativity and imagination in shaping the future. And that's why I'm thrilled now to be talking to a look who you know uh, was featured in the film and had such amazing things to say. Alok is an artist who uses every type of medium that you can think of to explore issues of race, gender, um, and to center our humanity and to center the human condition. Alok is also a writer whose latest book um, is Beyond the Gender Binary, which seeks to be a primer on gender fluidity Alok, um, thank you so much for joining us. You're kind of like, you're now in that category of people that just have one name, like Beyonce, Prince, Cher. So thank you so That's much. That's what for I'm trying to get to. Me. I really want to just be a one name kind of girl boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's also important for us to underscore and remember that Alok's pronouns are they and them, which is something that they unravel in part in Beyond the Gender Binaries. Thank you so much for first of all, sitting down um, today, but also during the film, I think you had so many powerful and insightful things to say, and I'm just so appreciative that you have come on to talk about them. Thanks so much for having me. One of the things that you, you talk about and you mention is, in the film is um, that sometimes what people see can be reductive, right? It can actually stifle their imagination, stifled their definitions of us. Um, that comment that you have about there's so many worlds within you and are we willing to explore them that you're so much more than we can see, I thought was real powerful. But at the same time, you are an amazing artist in so many different media and you use art to try to expand people's minds. So can you talk about this, that tension between the limitation of sight and the power of sight and how that imagination through that, through visual, through the visual arts is important for, for a future. Totally. So I think my critique of visibility is that it's, we specifically focus on the image without simultaneously also holding all the different registers. And so what I'm trying to do is like look, but also feel, but also think, but also touch, but also smell, but also there's so many other ways of engaging that are beyond the visual. And I think when it comes to trans people, for so long we've been denied existence beyond visibility. There's always this idea of quote, looking trans, or this idea of like, oh, she's not real enough, or he's not masculine enough. And it's like, it regulates the potentiality of what transness could be when we constantly discipline it into the visual. Because also in order for us to see something, we have to already have a frame of reference for it. And I think that we are missing out on noticing so many things that we're not able to see because there's no frame of reference for it. So I think a lot of what I liked about our conversations I was speaking to, so much of what I understand the future of transness to be is surrendering to the complexity of gender that we may never know it and that's its power. Right, right, right. Um, whoops, sorry about that. Um, but also, we also know that um, that imagination in and of itself is power, right? I mean, to a certain degree, you, like everyone, but you in some really powerful ways, create yourself out of the inspiration that you feel inside. And I think that that is something that is underestimated within everyone is the ability for us to manifest ourselves. and. Can you talk about that? And I mean, you do a lot of speaking to young people across the country and um, I'm wondering how you inspire them to do the same. Mm -hmm. I think that the body is a canvas and we are one of our most 
spectacular creative uh, projects. And we're constantly told that art is something that's external to us, but I think living is actually one of the most incredible art forms. And that's why I loved what Fatima was saying in the film, is actually being able to embrace your life journey as your creative practice and recognizing that embodiment is actually how you're bringing art to the world every day. And this is the legacy we come from. I think it's especially important to name in light of pride is future and past are false binary as well because there's so many continuities that exist. And one of the themes that I loved in the film was that connection. Because you have people like Sylvia and Marsha who are literally being criminalized for their creative self-expression. That Sylvia would literally be thrown into prison as a teenager because they would say that she was doing female impersonation from the shoulders up when she was wearing makeup. And we think about, okay, what was Sylvia doing when she continued to go back out presenting herself in this way? What she was actually saying is, I demand the right to author myself and no one else gets to interpret me because interpretation can be its own form of containment. And I think that what I really am trying to do with my art practice and what I'm trying to get young people to realize is like, you're allowed to be difficult and you're allowed to be complicated. You're allowed to be strange. You're not necessarily need to be understood in order to be accepted. And we have to break out of this kind of fatigue that's like everyone needs to know everything about us in order to get us. Maybe you don't know it, but you know that we still matter and that's what's important. That's right. And even, I mean, that is a really a point that I really wanted to make in the film, which is how um, there so much, I, I, I would wonder, right, the degree to which they were aware that they were actually helping to create a future for us because their imagination that they had and the embodiment that they have for themselves is such a source of, source of inspiration for us right now in so many different ways. And that one of the things I, I wanted to explore, and thank you for touching on it, is how even right now we're always still creating the future. Mm. And so there is that, that, that false binary in a, in a way that we may not even be realizing, you know? Mm. Mm. Um, um, speaking of creating the futures, one of the things I think that is really essential and the points that we make in the film is how um, gen erasing gender binaries is actually essential for us to have a future, right? We can't have a future of in gender binaries overall. And I'm just wondering if you have, what your thoughts are about that intersection between gender, gender binary and the future. Mm -hmm. I just wanna first say thank you so much for including that narrative in the film, because I think that that's a suppressed politics even within trans life and trans space, is that mm -hmm. so many people will say transgender recognition but they won't take it to the next step, which is we're trying to dismantle the gender binary. That's um, right. And I really appreciate in our conversation that we had for the film as well, we were saying actually this is something that people who are trans women, trans men, and non-binary can all get behind. And I wanted to explain that for the audience who might not understand. Moving beyond the gender binary is not about erasing your right to be a man or a woman. Rather, it's about saying that man and woman are two of infinite options and that we okay. should fight for a world where all genders are equally valid and where we don't have to have hierarchies that place masculinity over femininity, cisness over transness, and binariness over non-binariness. That in fact, all genders are your choice and your truth, and they don't need to be oppositional. And I think that that creates the capacity for so much resplendent and riotous freedom, because then we begin to do things not because we've been conditioned and categorized into them, but because we have to actually do the vulnerable work of asking, is this what I want? And I think what I love the most about the film and in each one of the narratives, you begin to see the risks that people went through to self-actualize. And for me, so much of what the power of transness is, is that we know that there's a kind of magic that comes from being able to realign your mind, body, and spirit that is so powerful that it's worth it. It's worth the social repression and the prejudice. And I think that that kind of spirit is the spirit that moves me to say moving beyond the gender binary will help the world actually embrace its own creativity over conformity. Um, well, I just wanted to let you know that someone posted to Ari Noel Lee who wanted to say thank you for giving um, uh, them the power to be strange and the permission to be strange. There are also people um, that are watching this with their children um, and with their trans children right now who are also commenting saying um, 
how powerful uh, this conversation is and how you are. And in my last question to you, I think it's really important that, that we're ending with that is that, you know, um, Beyond the Gender Binary is written as a primer that anyone can understand. I mean, Chase said that in our quote, virtual green room before we came on um, about how that was the case for them. And I'm wondering what you hope that a child, for instance, that reads your book gets from it about themselves and what you hope that their parents who may not be non-binary get about a child who is and they read your book to try to understand. Mm -hmm. You know, we're in a moment of crisis where there's so much anti-trans sentiment and legislation that is targeting trans and gender non-conforming young people. And Chase spoke to that in, in light of thinking about what the legal civil rights status of trans rights are in this post-Supreme Court era. And so for me, it's really important that we center trans and gender non-conforming youth in all of our conversations, because these folks are the people who are being targeted right now. And one of the things that I really want young people to understand, and for those of us who are caretakers of young people and adults, is that actually there's nothing wrong with creative self-expression. We continually dismiss that as a, fa as a fad or a phase or a trend. And it's like, actually, there's nothing wrong with literally just figuring it out and being a work in progress. And that you don't have to have finite answers, you don't have to have destinations, but it's so much more about the journey. And I think so much of the sacredness of transness is when we just surrender to the journey um, of just being like, you know what, I'm just gonna try to do what makes me feel right. And that, in part of our mentorship of young people, we need to actually give permission and license it's okay to take your time and it's okay to figure it out. And there are no right answers, but know that I support you in every leg of the, leg of the journey. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, people are continuing to thank you for helping to give language and expression to things that they did not have that for. Um, I think that you are a gift. Um, I am inspired by you. Um, and um, learn from you. And the other thing that people don't know about you because you appear to be and quite and are quite very serious is that you're also so much fun. <laughs> and um, I actually don't, I honestly don't see you enough, to be honest. It's so true, um, Marla, but let's just be real. Simultaneity looks like we can both have the politics and we can be at the dance party, politicking at the dance party at the same time. I know, I know, I know, but like you weren't, you, you weren't twerking as you were just unpacking the complexity of the gender binary, okay? Um, but thank you so much for, um, for joining us tonight. If people want to get the, the Beyond the Gender Binary, they ought to look until July because it's sold out. Yeah. Um, but um, please, when it comes back into print, get it. There's also a program that Elope has where you can buy um, the book and purchase it for people who may not be able to purchase it themselves who need it. So that's an ongoing program check out their uh, website, which is super easy to find. Alok, thank you so much for coming on. And um, I'm gonna figure out a Zoom call or some situation next month for real. Yeah, for real. totally. And congratulations on this film. And thank you so much for gifting this to our community. This representation is gonna save so many lives. So thank you. Thank, thank you. And you are a wonder person because you did a costume change during the middle of the show. You know, uh, it, I'm not it, supposed to say things like that, but I just told everybody, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. Have a great evening. Yeah, cheers. Cheers. That was uh, Alok, who is a um, non-binary performance artist, writer, thinker, hashtag, you name it, whose book, Beyond the Gender Binary, um, is in stores and now sold out. So please get it when you can. And keep your comments coming. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that the film has touched you all in so many different ways. It seems to be doing what I wanted it to do, which was to give us a sense of possibility and expansion. So um, thank you for that and keep sharing your comments and your thoughts and also tell other people to watch this film. We will post the link um, to it so that you can view it later, right at the end of the show. And then if you also go um, to our Facebook page, you can also see it there. Uh, thank you so much. Um, before we move on to our last, but definitely not least, Richie Shazam, there I go with my lightning, you know, um, thinking again. Um, I just wanted to say that if it's possible, we wanted to encourage you uh, to text the donate to um, WNYC in the green space. This is uh, a public 
um, radio station and public space that thrives off of people contributing. So five, ten dollars will help. If you go into the timeline right now, you can see how to donate. So text to donate um, so that we can keep programs like this going on. Well, last but not least is another artist um, who is the one, the only Richie Shazam, who is a multidisciplinary artist um, who is in New York, who's been featured in so many different places, Vogue, Vice, Interview Magazine, um, who also uses the power of images and thought to advance possibilities for, for us. And I think that it's really important for us to talk to Richie because of a work um, that she has done during this period. So without further ado, Richie Shazam, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Congratulations on the new film. It's so important for us to have this, especially in this time. Um, I'm so happy to be sharing space with you. 100%. What's going on tonight? You also had a like, costume change, you and Alok, like in the middle, boom, shazam. Uh, but you know what, that's the power of transness, honey. Uh, that's the power of transness. Um, one of the things I think is really important about your work, there's so many things that are important about your work that is powerful. People can see it on Instagram and can go to all the places that I just mentioned to see it and to learn from, is um, in this moment of death and plague, um, it felt for many people like the closing of possibilities, like we weren't gonna have a future, that everything was ending. But you used that period and it inspired you to create this amazing work called the Quarantine Diaries. And I'm just wondering how um, in this moment you felt inspired and driven to think about the future and how those things were linked for you. Absolutely, the, this time's been really essential and just, looking at my past work and really reflecting and trying to find the light and positivity and to also just assess where we're going right now. We're constantly looking into the future, but in order to look into the future, I have to process my present. And I, I try to utilize provocation, subversion, fantasy, I really want to look outside the box always and to show the world, you know, that we're here, we exist and we have very powerful stories. And I want people to understand the depths of my multi-hyphenated identity and um, yeah. Yeah, and one of the things that you were able to do so successfully is to use avant-garde, um, uh, images and approaches, and I mean that in the best use of that word, not esoteric or marginal, but like powerfully new in a way that we haven't seen before, to explore these issues of, um, of race and of gender and the way and immigration and so many things that intersect for you. Um, and I was wondering how you balance those how you integrate those complexities in your work because that's also a thing that we have to do if we're going to have to have a future we can't segment we have to figure out a way to do kind of what you do through your work absolutely i think the really understanding my own story and where i want to where i want to place my story in the world it's really coming to terms with um you know, the way I was raised and really looking into fantasy and looking into um, endless possibilities. I wanted, I wanted more for myself and I wanted, I never thought it would be possible to tell my story visually the way I saw fit. And it meant a lot of perseverance and a lot of strength and just, you know, a lot of rejection. And I think that I wanna rewrite and restructure, you know, beauty standards and aesthetics and really place our, our stories, our incredible revolutionary existence needs to be placed. And, you know, in a time of just utter discrimination and er erasure and violence, you know, I want my work to be a timestamp of today, but for the future. So it can be intergenerational, intersectional in every sense of the way, just really to connect the world and connect the dots and the pieces and yeah, I just continue want to push the envelope and be outside of the box. Yeah, I mean, it definitely feels that way. 
Um, there's so many images that I can think of right now where I've seen you in that it totally redefines beauty and to push the images. And again, I really want to encourage people to see your work because it's an example of art, not as something that's in museums, but really helping to change, change the way that we can see and think about the world around us. Um, that's what I really appreciate by, by what you, uh, uh, in what you do um, through your work. Um, and I guess lastly, one of the questions that I had is that on this point, you are such a powerful, again, like a look, a very powerful artist that uses images that are iconic, quite frankly. A lot of your images are iconic after we see them. It's hard to forget them in that way. Um, and I'm wondering when you were growing up in New York City as an immigrant, as a person who is trans, as a, who's a person of color, could you see yourself as you are now? Did you imagine yourself as you are now when you were a child? It's such a, it's such an intense question. Like just, you know, looking, I feel like I've, I've had so many different identities over the years. You know, I, I think that understanding that we're allowed to transform and we have this chameleon like ability to, you know, to further explore and to further investigate who we are and who we want to be and to feel that comfort and I think the power of my chosen family and the incredible people that have uplifted me and kept kept me going to give me all the necessary tools to live freely and to exist freely you know I have just immense gratitude and I think if I were to, you know, look, speak to my younger self, I would definitely tell them to keep pushing. And, you know, when someone says no, you're going to find a way to, to say yes. No one's going to close any door on you. Like, you're going to find a way to open that door and come with a vengeance, you know? Like, I can live my truth. I can tell the stories I want to tell. And, yeah, I think I'm always going through it. It's never easy. It's so much anxiety and fear just existing, but my ability to storytell and to create through visual means has given me a lot of strength. Mm -hmm. I have to continue to um, tell stories. Well, someone just um, commented, go Richie, yes, Richie. So um, you are clearly touching people um, with your work and through your work. And even in what you just said right now, I mean, I can't think of a better way to end um, our conversations tonight with what you just said is that we have the permission to be all of ourselves and all of our manifestations and we get to be chameleon. We don't only have to be one thing in our lives. We get to have the power of change as we, as we go along and change through our identities. And there is nothing more futuristic to me than that comment. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your work. Um, I really want to encourage people um, to continue to seek it out. And I hope to see um, what you do in so many more places. Thank you so much, Richie. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to just be here and celebrate with you and have costume changes and just come alive. Um, I hope that we can get to a space where we don't have to be on Zoom meetings anymore. And we can just celebrate each other IRL. Yeah, well, on a personal note, I know that you're Guyanese. And once upon a time, I had a Guyanese boyfriend and I learned how to make all these different things like Castle Reef and cook up. So maybe that can be on the agenda. Girl, you got to cook for me. <laughs> I'm coming over. I'm coming over. We're going to turn up. We're going to turn up. Thank you so much, uh, Richie. That is Richie Shazam, who is a multidisciplinary artist in New York um, who uses their work to push the boundaries of our understanding of race, gender, sexuality, immigration, and immigrant status. Please check out their work, their powerful work on Instagram and also in both and so many other places. You are watching Lives at Stake. Um, lives at stake. Uh, use that hashtag and also TransLash and the Future of Trans to continue to comment. Well, sadly, we have reached the end of our program tonight. Um, it has meant the world for me to not only be able to show you uh, this work that I've spent the last year working on, but also 
to have these incredible conversations with so many people who are using law and visual images and books and artistry to shape and change our future. I hope that you end tonight with an idea that the future is limitless, that it means us breaking boundaries, that it means us finding new ways of finding ways to create um, rather than consume and destroy, that it means loving ourselves and being all of ourselves who we are over time. And as I said, at a time of social erasure and closure and threats, that imagining our futures is a radical act. So thank you for being radical with me over the last hour. I wish you a terrific week. Please join us on the next Lives at Stake, which will be on July 30th. Maybe you'll actually see me broadcasting from the studio. You guys probably won't be there, but I'll be in the studio in a different place. Uh, we'll see whether or not we can make that happen. But again, thank you so much for joining us and keep being radical. Keep thinking about your future, the future of trans.